Welcome to Into the Mind of Music. My guest today is a keyboardist who never seems to run out of ideas. He can write songs in any genre, rock, jazz, blues, Latin, pop, you name it, he can write it. He's a music educator. He played in a band with Harry Leahy, who is a Grammy-winning artist with the Phil Woods Quartet. He's the creative writing force behind the band, On The Edge. My good friend and music mentor, Vincent Partisi. Hi, welcome to John Thompson Music. Hi, Vinny, let's just get right into this, my brother. Um, what was it like growing up as a kid, man, when you were a little guy? Like, how did, what was your upbringing? Well, I was brought up in an Italian family, and I went to Catholic school. In the second grade, I was uh, seven, and uh, the teacher, he offered music lessons on the accordion, either accordion or piano, but we could afford a piano. So I went, and my mom took me to Keyport, and there was an accordion place there. We picked out an accordion, and at seven years old, I started to take lessons, read the music. I went from the uh, 60 bass to the 120 bass. And at that point, I was about 10 years old, and the accordion was like bigger than me, you know? And I used to go to these um, accordion uh, contests, you know, uh, for all these accordion players. And I'll never forget, uh, I won the contest twice, and then I had to move up to a new level because I turned 11. So I had to go with the 11 to 13 year olds. Uh, you were getting old at that point, 11. I was getting old, yeah. And let me tell you, <laughs> at 11 years old, I, I, I blew through a bunch of accordion. I had talent, I had some talent. So my mom and dad put the money in. She took me for the lessons. And in my day, just for all you youngsters out there, if you didn't practice your half an hour, you didn't eat. <laughs> it was a very simple <laughs> thing. They wouldn't let you, you eat. Know, and, no, man, no. You got to finish your half an hour. Now, my, I eat a lot of cold suppers. But um, I was always motivated to finish practicing by 5 o'clock because at 5 o'clock, the ice cream truck came. Sam, the ice cream man. Sam was an interesting character. He used to be a, uh, a taxi driver at Nork, and he had one eye. He had an eye patch. He only had one. He got shot in a robbery. My father told me the story years later. So when Sam the Ice Cream Man came, I always wanted to be done practicing. Anyway, the big song on the accordion was Lady of Spain. Okay, da 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 da. And uh, you know, so when I was 11, I tackled that, but I didn't win the contest. I came in second, so I was pissed off. So I said, <laughs> I said to my mother, I said, Mom, I didn't win. She says, Well, Vincent. You're only 11. You know, if my mother was, right. well, you know, you know, uh, you know, my mom, uh, she was the inspiration for everything I did as far as artistically. So um, I quit the accordion because I didn't win. And I started playing piano. That's when I was 11. And um, what we did, we had to get a, uh, I used to go to my neighbor across the street, play the piano. Uh, then about, I got into uh, eighth grade. And I always would play the piano at the school, all right? But I still, my parents still couldn't afford to get a piano. And actually, I didn't, the first piano I had was actually the Fender Rose 88, which I bought later, like when I was about 13, 14. And that was um, the hip, that was the hip thing to have. Then. Oh, you had oh, to have. Man, it was like, piano. it was like fucking 120 pounds. And like, you know, I couldn't, I mean, I was, I was 120 pounds. So. <laughs> It, it was a little bit rough. It's rough to carry but, uh, those things. I always felt time, sorry for you guys back in the day with all that. Oh, stuff, the oh man, it was all heavy. It was heavy. And I just want you to know that over my shoulder, I have that Fender Rhodes right here in my studio. And um, I've been playing a lot lately. Uh, it's just, John, 45 years, and it's in perfect tune. Mm. It's in perfect oh. tune. The Steinway cannot compete. The Steinway, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, I mean, it's a great piano. I have a 1948 Steinway uh, S, you know, baby grand. But 
the, the fender roads. So anyway, it built up my hands because it's not easy as for it to play. So when you're only 13, 14 playing this thing, all right. And then I remember, um, well, gee whiz, let's see. I remember then getting into my teens and, you know, of starting being bands. And so that's where it all, all came together. And um, I got a Farfisa organ, the compact duo, I think it was called. And I was said I had, I didn't take the Fender Rhodes out. I took the organ <laughs> on the gigs. And then when I got a little older, uh, I started taking the Fender Rhodes out because I was in bigger bands. We were playing, well, back in 1976, I was in a band called Southbound. And we were on the circuit with all of these other groups down the shore, like the Rum Runner, the Kerners Garter, the Brothers Three, the Playpen, the Arrow Lounge, Oh, Julio's, gosh. right? Are there memories, right? Wasn't it glorious we, back then? It was it was absolutely crazy in New Jersey back then. It it was like a fantasy land back then. It was, believe me, if the people nowadays that are breaking into music and are in their 20s would know what the scene was like in the late 70s and 80s. No matter where you you didn't have to bring anybody to 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 see you, you know. They were there. Hundreds of people. I mean, the, how about the Squires Inn at Far Hills? They had three rooms. They had a disco room, a hard rock room, and a lounge. And throughout the course of my little career uh, in the 70s and by about the mid-80s, I played all those rooms, you know. And then finally, things changed. Things changed in the 80s when they, ban they started banning smoking in the clubs. Uh, in 1981, uh, I went on the road. With, with a band and we uh, went on the road for Stan Klein agency. And you had to see that boy. I had the Fender Rhodes. We, we had a U-Haul on the back of my Chevy Impala. <laughs> the trunk of the Impala could have fit. Well, you know what was in the trunk? My bandmaster cabinet, which was pretty much as tall as, as me, you know, and the bandmaster head. And then in, in the, tr in the U-Haul was the rest of my, you know, the Fender Rhodes. And um, I think I had an ARP, pro soloist synthesizer they were they were great days uh, we went out on the road uh we were called the first light band and we opened up for some some major big acts we met some some really good people like in detroit we met bob seeger one night he was just hanging out at this club don't forget this was 1980 81 so he was already kind of you know pretty famous but he you know just like bruce will go hang out uh, down the shore so um, anyway, I'll tell you one quick story, then we'll move on, about the Fender Rhodes, since we're on that subject. So we, there used to be a place called um, the Binghamton Ferry. And it was a, did you ever know that place? It was docked off of Fort Lee, up by Fort Lee. It was, a, it was an actually boat, and it was a big disco on, on the water, right? So I remember we got a gig out of the Binghamton Ferry, and we went, we had to go on the dock, you know, some dock up there in Fort Lee, around Fort Lee anyway. You, you don't have to quote me on all this, a little fuzzy, but yeah. I do remember taking the Fender Rhodes out of the car and there's this guy, this big, heavy, this, you know, strong looking guy. And he says, hey, you want me to help you with that? I said, sure, you take one and I'll take the other. <laughs> he says, no need to do that. He took the freaking Fender Rhodes 88 and put it on his shoulder. And carry it like 300 yards down the pier and onto the boat and put it on the stage. I, it was the greatest feat of strength I ever saw. Later, I found he was. Uh, I, I said, thought you were going to tell me. No, he was going to pick it up and said, nah, forget this. He threw no, I put it on his shoulder, carried it all the way into the boat. <laughs> and it ended up that, that that man was Bobby Chez, the fighter, the boxer. Oh. That's who he was. I didn't know who he was. But th this was, again, like in the late 70s, your early 80s type of deal. And I don't even know when he became uh, real famous as a boxer, but it was Bobby Chez. And um, everybody told me later, you know, I looked for him when the gig was over, but he was gone already. So I had to carry it myself back out of there. <laughs> yeah, where'd that guy go, you know, at the end of the night? Where are you at the end of the night? Man, John, how many gigs right. did we play? Oh, I mean, yeah. just... It was a scene, like you said, John, 
it was a scene like you'll not, you may never see again. Yeah, Clubs I mean, the drinking popping. age was 18, right? The yeah. drinking age was 18. Yeah. They, they lowered the drinking age. And every place you went, there was 700 people, 750 <laughs> people, kept capacity clubs and Art Stock out of all of those rooms with all Oh, the Art Stock. And, oh, God, all, all his clubs, all yeah. Those rooms, you know? so we had a good run. Let me ask you this. When you were in uh, high school, right? Think back to high school. What what were you listening to back then? What what were you, I mean, were you into the jazz stuff by then in high school or were you, you know, listening to the popular uh, bands like, of course, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, yes, Genesis, were you listening to that or were you into the jazz stuff? So when I was in eighth grade, just before high school, I had a friend, Excuse me. a friend named uh, Rogan was his last name. And he actually was the first guy started me turning me up because I had come up in a situation where I read music like like I could read the newspaper back then. And so the songs I knew were the songs that were given to me by my teachers throughout the years. Mm -hmm. So when I went fine so I really wasn't very hip until until around eighth grade and this guy Rogan, Mike Rogan, wherever he is in the world, uh, he says, Did you ever hear Grand Funk Railroad? Did you ever hear yeah? And so now Zeppelin was starting to come out. This was 1970, of course, when, when, when I was uh, in grammar school. And that's what got me started. Grand Funk Railroad, um, of course, the Beatles. Th there's no way to say this, yeah, except right. that I quit playing the accordion. Uh, yeah, I, I lost, I came in second place. But I really quit because of the Beatles. 19, when I saw them on the Ed Sullivan show, and I was, I guess, eight or nine, nine, and uh, I was playing the accordion. I'll never forget, I asked my teacher if I could have a Beatles song. Well, there were no Beatles songs for accordion. <laughs> so, so he used to find fake books for me. I, uh, I started to play out of fake books. Uh, and I started to learn how to, how to do the left-hand bass, you know, based on the chords that were written. So, uh, so in high school, yes. No, I was not into jazz yet. I was into, um, first time I got into jazz was Return to Forever. And Herbie Hancock, Bandchild album, uh, Chick Corea, uh, uh, Miles Davis, Bitches Brew. That was a hell of an album. I mean, how many people were on that album that we know, you know? Right. And, and then I realized that there's a second level of playing. There's a different level. The Beatles will never, you know, die in my heart. I mean, I, I, as you well know, I probably could play most of their repertoire. And they, they were a big influence all through my life. But um, Zeppelin didn't have a real piano player. So I'll never forget that, you know, I used to play in bands that played Zeppelin. Might have too much to do. Until that song, Casimir. Yeah. Da -da -da, da -da -da, da -da 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 you know. And finally, I had my big chance to play some rock and roll. And then um, Grand Funk Railroad. Uh, oh, my God. You know, all of them. All of those. Uh, the Who. But, you know, for a keyboard player in the mid-70s, you know, you had to go to like the Guess Who, or you had to go to um, uh, or deep well, uh, uh, right, right. Uh, oh. What's his name? The piano player, uh, Doctor John, was was starting to come around back then, and um, there wasn't a lot of piano idols. You know, it, uh, there was Jimmy Page, and there was you know Mark Farner, and all of those. Until, as you said, the band Yes came out, and the band where I started getting hip to Yes and Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Genesis. Oh man, I was a big ELP, Yes, Genesis freak for many years through my late, right, through the high school years. And then um, I started getting into jazz around, cause I was always played, I played in bands. I played my own junior cotillion in high school, you know. Um, and, and then I started to get more exposed when I heard Korea and Herbie Hancock. These were my two biggest influences. So I said, well, I'm not having much luck with this Everson Lake and Palmer stuff. <laughs> so I think I'll try jazz. And Keith Emerson was really quite talented. Um, as you probably, if you've seen him in concert, he used to actually stick a knife in the B3 to hold down certain notes. So he would hold down a try. Yeah, he would. He'd stick two knives in there and hold down like and a hold triad down or a third. Yeah, and hold down the keys while he went to other keyboards. It was 
And then, of course, Carl Palmer, you know, used to do the drum solo, and the whole stage rotated while yeah, he was doing kind. the drum solos. They all had their concert. They always had their concert in, like, you know, uh, four, whatever you call it, you know, four speakers going around the auditorium and stuff. Those, those were wild days back when I was 17, 18. And, uh, but I had been playing already, you know, for a long time. So um, jazz, yeah, jazz. Then I started uh, at my wedding in 19. 81 I got married and uh Harry Leahy played at my wedding Harry Leahy was a great jazz guitarist he has won Grammy Awards with the Phil Woods Quartet back in the 70s and 80s and um I went in and sat in with the wedding band you know at my own wedding like a lot of guys do and he invited me to stay you know, why don't you come in and join the band that was that was a real big thing for me because I didn't know whether I was good or not. I just knew that I had a good ear and I had pretty good hands. But my friends were all studying from Harry Leahy, my guitar player friends. He was their teacher. So the band asked me to sit in with them. And I did on a few songs. When the wedding was over and they were packing up, Harry came up to me and asked me, would I like to stay with the band? Which was a big honor for me at the time. I was about 25 years old. And uh, many of my friends had studied or were still studying with Harry. So it was a great opportunity for me. And I joined the band. It was a, uh, a lounge band, but played a lot of standards. So it was an education for me to be on stage with Harry two, three nights a week for a couple of years. Whenever he would come back from being on tour with Phil Woods, he, he would be in other bands. You know, Harry made money. He was a working professional musician. And he, he was like a mentor to me to see what it's like to really be a pro, to go out on the road, go to Japan uh, with, with the Phil Woods Quartet, then come back and play little lounges with, with Vinny Partizzi, right? So it was a really good time in my life. And um, I think that lasted pretty much about two years, two, three years. And at which time I had my first child, Steven. So uh, the band that I was in with Harry kind of disbanded like many bands do. And I started to move forward from there to other kinds of things. Uh, I did a lot of lounge bands. I, uh, as, as you probably did, John, um, played with, I don't know, I wouldn't say hundreds, no, but dozens of bands, you know, dozens. And um, I started to get into more composing. I think that life, you have to live a little life before you have something to say, you know? And I wrote a lot of vocal tunes uh, back in the day. I wrote for the disco era. I wrote police songs that sound like the police. And many of these things are on uh, my Reverb Nation uh, dot com. Uh, uh, Vincent Partici. Yeah. So um, let's, let's tell them where they can where they can actually go and, um, you know, listen to your music and download. What's the uh, couple of sites that you have? Well, I have, uh, I am Vincent Partizzi on ReverbNation.com slash Vincent Partizzi. I'm also on SoundCloud, but there I am Vinny Partizzi, V-I-N-N-I-E, for those of you who are into grammar. And uh, you'll find a lot of my old material there from the years and years. Vocal songs, some jazz songs. Um, I pretty much wrote mostly only vocal songs until I felt that I had enough chops in my head to write compositional type songs. And I think that after I got married and I had the experience with Harry, uh, I was able to do that. Of course, the website for the most recent project that I did with you, my brother, uh, On The yeah, Edge. That was wonderful. It was, that was great. That was a wonderful thing. I mean, Okay, guys, so if, you, if you look up in the corner here, right where I'm pointing now, that right there is Vinny, and if I go the, this way, <laughs> that's me. That's you. And then Joe Navolo right there. I'm so proud of this band. How does this look? Yep. And then this is, is our, this is our CD, Interplay, On the Edge Interplay. That was so much fun doing. And uh, it was just an experience playing with you two monster musicians, and it was like, I couldn't even believe I was even in the band anyway with you guys, but you know, 
it was a hell of a it was, it was a hell of an experience you know doing that you know john i met you at least 20 years ago i would say long i time. mean at jams a long time we played our hearts out at jams and people's basements and and outside gigs and i i never played with a better bass player than you mr thompson you've got the feel well, and also I appreciate me and you that. we have we have developed a connection over the years i'll never forget playing a gig with you and joey bellia from the weaklings um and uh we were in the middle of of the song and you told me go to the bridge but it wasn't four beats yet, but I, I said, John said, go to the bridge. I'm going to the bridge. Go to the bridge. That's, that's it. <laughs> One, follow two, three. Me. We follow go. John. I followed you right into that bridge, and we both went off the bridge, back on the bridge. But this is the, the joy of music. To get in touch with Mr. Partizzi about his original music or lessons, he can be reached at ReverbNation.com, Vincent Partisi on SoundCloud, Vinny Partisi dash keys on Broad Jam Vincent Partisi. Thank you very much once again for tuning in to Into the Mind of Music. Please click the subscribe button and ring the bell if you'd like to be notified when my podcasts come out, generally every Monday and Wednesday. I'll have my Linktree link in the description. You can click on that and get to all my social media. Until next time, peace, love, and music for all.